We have reached a critical mass, and uh, I, you know, there's always this little brief trade-off. But but I, I notice with my Japanese friends are so punctual. We're going to get started, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here today. My name is John Hamley. I'm the president here at CSIS, and uh, I'm just delighted to that we can welcome all of you to this is our fifth joint conference with JetRO and CSIS. Uh, Hayashi-san, thank you for giving us the opportunity to partner with you. I, uh, I, I had dinner with Hayashi-san last night and I said, you know, I wish America had a JetRO. We, we need somebody that's getting us going, you know, on trade policy. It's one of the great voids we have right now in American policy. Is we don't really know what the hell we're doing on trade. And uh, I hope we're going to explore a bit of that today. Uh, since we last met, uh, we've had some fairly remarkable developments. And of course, we have a, an entirely new political landscape in Japan. And it's a new landscape we're trying to understand. I mean, we obviously know Japan from long and intimate relations with Japan, but this is a new Japan. And it's a new Japan that's emerging. And it's uh, exciting, a little confusing, but there's a great deal of interest and hope in what's going to be coming forward. And my sense is you have the same feeling about us. We're not exactly sure where we're going. So I think we're going to explore this today. I think we have two interweaving themes that we're going to be uh, we're going to be dedicating various perspectives to during the day, looking at the way that uh, Asia is coming together, especially economically, and then the bilateral relationship with the United States and Japan. And you know, there have always been two axes in uh, our relations between our two countries. There's been a security axis and an economic axis. And they've pulled against each other. You know, and it's been a creative dynamic. We've had some times when it was pretty tough. Uh, I can remember as a, as a much younger guy when, when we had the car wars, you know, very bitter battles. Now, I, I know there are some friends in, in Japan who have been watching it the way that uh, the president Toyota was treated in in his hearing last week in the Congress and some concern about that. I would only ask you to go back and look at the videos of how American car company presidents were treated, which was really brutal. And uh, I think it, 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 uh, there was a respect uh, that I think has been earned by the success of, of Toyota and the automotive industry in Japan. And we saw that, actually. We saw that. You may not have seen it. But I hope you would take a fresh look at it, because it, I think, shows a deeper understanding that we now have of each other that we're going to take into the future. We're going to take into the future in ways that we don't yet understand. And so we're going to explore all of this together today. So I, I want to say thank you. I, I should be introducing uh, President Hayashi, Chairman Hayashi. But we're going to let him do the closing remarks, and he's going to open our first panel session. But let me again say thank you to Jetro for the great partnership we enjoy with them. Mike Green, let me turn to you so that you can get our program going today. Thank you all for coming. We're glad you're here. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, welcome. This is our fifth uh, collaboration and annual conference between JETRO and CSIS on economic integration in Asia and the implications for the United States and Japan. It's a partnership with JETRO that has been enormously um, uh, uh, rich for us at CSIS and uh, uh, Chairman Hayashi and uh, the rest of his colleagues at JETRO in New York and Tokyo um, and our own fellow from JETRO here at CSIS have put a lot of work into all of these conferences. Um, here at CSIS, Nick said, Cheney, Ari Hirano, and uh, the rest of the Japan chair have uh, worked very hard on the um, logistics and the agenda. We do this annually in a way to, to, to take a, a, a snapshot, a fresh look at trends in regional trade, investment, finance. Um, and we do so uh, from a political economy or strategic perspective, uh, trying to integrate um, different points of view. So you'll find on our panel today we have uh, business leaders, uh, foreign policy practitioners, uh, scholars, um, and representatives of, 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 uh, of the U.S. and Japanese governments um, giving their giving their take. Um, I will in a moment introduce Professor Shiraishi, who will set the uh, tone for today's uh, conference. And then in the first panel, Chairman Hayashi will uh, make some opening remarks and share. And uh, 
that first panel will be a look at regional uh, uh, trade and investment trends and the political implications of those trends uh, from U.S. and Japanese experts. Um, uh, Hayashi san will chair, and uh, Hidehiko Nishiyama, who is the Director General for International Trade Policy uh, at METI, uh, will, will, will speak. Um, Professor Maria Toyota from Villanova, who's here at CSIS as a visiting scholar and a noted expert on uh, Japanese um, international economic policy. Um, uh, Genpachiro Aihara from Mitsui and Company, who is um, the chair of ABAC, uh, the uh, business uh, organization, and Steve Began from Ford Motor Company. So we'll get U.S. and Japanese business, um, official and scholarly um, uh, uh, perspectives. We'll take a break, and then I'll chair uh, the next panel after that, which will take a, a fresh look at the same set of trends, but from outside the U.S.-Japan relationship. We have two distinguished speakers, uh, Wei Ping Huang, uh, professor of the School of Economics at Renmin University in China, and Jenny Corbett, who's the Executive Director of the Australia-Japan Research Center at ANU at Australian National University. Um, I will then make a brief, um, uh, hopefully productive effort to sum up some of the uh, trends, and then over lunch we'll hear the uh, uh, Obama administration's perspective from Kurt Tong, uh, who is the uh, Economic Coordinator for the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs and the Senior APEC Official for the U.S. So it's a pretty uh, 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 dense and rich um, agenda. Um, I think from our discussion last night over dinner, you'll find um, that the intersection of uh, trade finance and political changes this last, last year are quite profound. Um, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, uh, there are clearly uh, new trends uh, taking root in trans-Pacific trade investment. Um, but uh, I think you'll also find that trade within Asia is also, and investment within Asia is also taking some different uh, uh, directions uh, this past year. Um, particularly, um, as I think we'll hear from some of the speakers, um, uh, the uh, changing nature of Japanese, Korean, and developed economies trade with China. Uh, China posted a trade deficit in January, so China's different in perspective on trade, and uh, ASEAN and Southeast Asia's um, uh, growing um, uh, dependence on China for exports. We'll get to all of that, and we'll talk about some of the political implications and some of the larger strategic uh, issues. Uh, in particular, I think we will quiz some of our Japanese colleagues about what uh, Prime Minister Hatsuyama has in mind with an East Asia community, and we'll quiz some of our American colleagues about uh, uh, when, whether, how the Obama administration will uh, put some details into a trade strategy for Asia. But let's set the, uh, set the overall direction uh, for today's conference uh, with an opening presentation from Professor Takashi Shiraishi. Um, Shiraishi-san is um, one of the most respected uh, Japanese scholars of not only U.S.-Japan relations, of course, but, um, but uh, Japan's relations with Asia and developments within East Asia. He's, I think it's fair to say, an Indonesianist by training, studied and taught at Cornell, um, taught at, at Tokyo University. He's now the uh, president of Jetro's Institute for Developing Economies, um, an executive member of the Council for Science and Technology Policy, and a week or two ago was announced as one of the members of the new defense advisory uh, panel that will be making um, uh, uh, strategic uh, and programmatic recommendations for the Japanese government as they prepare for the next midterm defense plan. So he is uh, a true utility infielder uh, doing uh, Asian economics, U.S.-Japan relations, security studies, um, and is the perfect person to uh, open up our conference. So Shirishi Sensei, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we look forward to your uh, setting us on the right trajectory. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I used to have a nightmare uh, when I was still teaching at Cornell. And the nightmare is to find myself in the classroom in front of the students without any lecture notes. And uh, I had that uh, nightmare again last night. So <laughs> uh, I guess you know, and, uh, you can see uh, how nervous I am today. But uh, let me try. Um, what I'd like to do today is basically revisiting Japan's foreign policy. Um, since the new government uh, uh, came to power in September last year, uh, there is a confusion 
a little bit of confusion at least uh, caused by Prime Minister Hatoyama and others uh, about the direction of Japan's foreign policy, especially Japan-US alliance. And my argument is there is nothing fundamental, uh, I mean there is no fundamental shift there uh, in the relationship, but uh, they naturally I mean, want to show that they are different from LDP and therefore once in a while with, uh, uh, with excitement uh, they might sort of hint that uh, there is uh, what they are doing is in fact recalibrating the relationship and yet sometimes they sound as if they are reviewing the relationship. And I would argue therefore that despite all the sort of noises and so on uh, and despite the change in domestic <coughs> politics, the international regional structure will dictate Japan's policy as it is. And, and also I would suggest that uh, there are some sort of, you know, I mean, ways in which LDP, uh, not, not LDP, DPJ government may want to show that they are different from LDP. But before going to, into that discussion, let me uh, show two sort of large trends in, this, uh, in the region of East Asia. One is here, long-term world economic forecast released by Japan Center for Economic Research two years ago. And here, uh, original uh, I mean, uh, forecast was done on, uh, based on the year 2000 uh, purchasing parity dollar. Uh, but uh, I'm not really interested in absolute numbers and therefore I sort of process to make it uh, comparative uh, with Japanese, Japanese economic size. And if you look at this table, it is quite clear that at least in purchasing parity dollar, uh, Japanese, uh, Chinese economy by 2020 will be four times larger than Japan's, five times larger than Japan's in 2030, six times larger than Japan's in two, uh, 2040, and less, uh, a little bit less than seven times larger uh, than Japan's by 2050. And by 2030, uh, the China will be five times, five times larger, but India also two times larger and twice as large as Japan's. And ASEAN is a bit larger than Japan and United States and Euro uh, European Union are of course uh, 4.5 or 3.5 times larger than Japan. That means by 2030, there will be four major powers in this world which are China, US, uh, India, and European Union, and Japan is not part of that club. Um, and this, of course, you can, dis um, you can debate about how close to the mark this forecast will be, but certainly you can be reasonably sure that uh, Japan will not be like a giant in East Asia as it was 20 years ago, and Japan is a kind of middling power uh, I mean, in terms of economic size in 20 years. And as the distribution of wealth changes over the coming 20, 30 years, naturally the distribution of power will also change. The question is the, the order uh, might change either in revolutionary or evolutionary way, and certainly it is to uh, everybody's interest to make sure that the regional order of East Asia will change evolutionary way uh, as the distribution of power and wealth uh, undergoes significant changes. And number two, the next uh, large trend is the population trend, and this is quite straightforward. Um, by 2030, the, the East Asian population, uh, and here Japan is not included, uh, the East Asian population will be something like uh, um, 2.4 billion, uh, and 62% of the population will be living in urban centers. And in the case of China, it will be 41%, uh, Indonesia 68%, and 
in countries like Philippines, South Korea, and Malaysia, the urban population will be more than 75%, while even mainland Southeast Asian countries, uh, urban, uh, urbanization rate will almost reach 50%. So Asia in 20 years will be very much urban world. Uh, and yet, um, if uh, we think, uh, uh, and, and suddenly uh, maybe one quarter to one third of the urban population will be urban middle class people. Um, but um, most likely, uh, other than Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, and Singapore, all the other countries will not attain the kind of middle class, middle class society. That means the gap between urban middle classes and rural poor, as well as uh, uh, urban poor, will remain. And, uh, and therefore, to manage this deepening and, uh, and increasingly urban social division, uh, uh, economic growth will remain a crucial test to manage this tension. So this is a second trend. And, the, uh, and of course, what is important is how to locate its trends in the larger historical context. So let me go back to history and how the system, the, the regional international system, has been structured in uh, East Asia. Uh, maybe some of you still remember the word Free Asia. Uh, it, uh, it was a word Americans used in the 1950s and 60s when the, the, there was uh, the Cold War and China was still staunchly communist. I mean, in 1950, China went communist, and then there was a war in uh, Korean Peninsula, and also there were I mean, independence war uh, in Indochina and so on. Mm -hmm. And in those era, I think Americans did two things. One is to contain the international communism. The Americans created a regional hub and spokes uh, security system with Japan, U.S., Korea, I mean U.S., Korea, uh, U.S., Philippines, U.S., Thailand, uh, and so on, bilateral security treaties and basis agreement, and, and, and created uh, U.S.-led security, I mean regional security system. At the same time, the American government, especially in the 1950s, encouraged the Japanese government under uh, Mr. Yoshida and then uh, uh, Mr. Kishi, uh, to go to Southeast Asia uh, to explore uh, the market because uh, before the war, China was the second largest market for Japan, but, uh, but and actually Japanese business wanted to expand trade with China in the 1950s, but allowing Japanese business to trade with China would undermine America's containment policy. And therefore, basically, Americans encouraged Japanese business to go south. But for that, Japanese government needed to normalize diplomatic relations. And therefore, Japan concluded reparation treaties with Southeast Asian countries. And by 1960s, Japanese business were back in Southeast Asia and created a kind of triangular trade system among Japan, Southeast Asia, especially Southeast Asia in Free Asia and the United States. So this was a kind of beginning. You know, on the one hand, we had uh, American-led um, American hub and spoke security system in the region, and we also had the triangular trade system uh, in East Asia. And these two systems underwent enormous changes, especially over the last 30 years. Uh, if we look at the American-led security system, uh, American, uh, I mean, uh, after the end of the, uh, of the war in Vietnam, American troops were withdrawn from mainland Southeast Asia. And after the revolution in the Philippines, uh, American bases in the Philippines were also dismantled. So in fact, even though the American-led security system remains as the most important security system in the region, the system itself became uh, um, uh, shrunk. And uh, as it shrunk, 
Japan-US alliance became more important in this system. And by now, probably we can reasonably say that once US-Japan alliance is gone, the, this security system is most likely to be gone too. Uh, the second important development was the economic front. Um, and there are two very important developments over the last uh, 30 years. First of all, in the wake of the Plaza Accord in 1985, uh, Japanese yen appreciated enormously and as a result uh, to maintain international competitiveness uh, Japanese firms uh, shifted their production facilities onto Southeast Asia as well as uh, South Korea, Taiwan and later on uh, to China and uh, South Korean firms, Taiwanese firms, as well as Southeast Asian firms also did the same thing uh, in the late 1980s. And therefore, by the end of the 1980s, the region of East Asia, in, and in that case, uh, Korea, South Korea, Japan, uh, coastal regions of China, as well as Southeast Asia, especially ASEAN 4 plus Singapore, uh, became integrated uh, without any institutional design. I mean, microeconomic decisions of uh, companies basically led to de facto economic integration of the region. And in the same years, China opened up, started uh, its reform, and uh, by, the, the, by the early 1990s, China succeeded in transforming itself from socialist party state to socialist market economy party state while being integrated into this emerging East Asian economy. And in the past 10 years, especially after the Asian crisis in 1997-98, China has emerged as a new center of triangular trade. And here, uh, different from the, the earlier triangular <coughs> trade, uh, China now imports both capital goods and the intermediate goods from uh, Asia other than China, like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, as well as some Southeast Asian countries, assemble uh, I mean, and produce final products and export those products to the America, American market as well as European <coughs> and Japanese market. And therefore, the kind of triangular trade emerged among China, Asia minus China, and the United States. And what is interesting about this development is in Asia, as you, can, uh, as you know, no socialist countries collapsed. While in Europe, socialist states collapsed and became democratic states, even Soviet Union collapsed. And after the collapse of all these socialist states, NATO expanded eastward, and within that expanding NATO, European Union also expanded eastward. And therefore, in Europe, there is no tension between the security system, regional security system, NATO, and the economic or, economic, uh, or trade system, uh, which is European Union. In East Asia, tension remains. Uh, despite the transformation of China as well as Vietnam from socialist states into socialist market states, they remain party states. And even North Korea and Myanmar have survived, not as successful socialist market states, but rather, I would say, rogue states. And yet, you know, they remain. And therefore, and, and, and given this reality, it is quite clear and easy to understand why American-led security system never expanded onto the, uh, onto the uh, Asian mainland to include China, Vietnam, and so on. So there is tension. On the one hand, the US-led security system remains as it is, or rather, it became smaller while the economic or trade system expanded to include China, Vietnam, and so on. And now China is crucial part 
of the trading system. And therefore, there is tension. And this tension will mount as China rises in years to come. Uh, because China is so crucial. And yet, economic integration is a must because, as I mentioned earlier, many countries, in fact, many governments are still confronted with creating jobs so that managing the, the, the kind of class gap between urban middle class and poor. And therefore, they have to continue what I call politics of productivity. And therefore, economic integration will, will proceed. And that means China will remain a key part of this integration. And also, this is important for Japan, because Japanese market is shrinking, and Japanese firms can only uh, develop uh, 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 hoping to exploit these expanding regional markets. So the tension will not only remain, but actually tension will mount as China uh, rises. The question is what to do. Domestically, in Japan, it's quite, quite, quite clear that the, this tension will cause a lot of problems for any government. If the LDP government opted for strengthening Japan-US alliance, for example, Mr. Koizumi called for the global partnership between the United States and Japan, and then he was criticized for neglecting Asia. And now Mr. Hatoyama is calling for East Asian Economic Community, and then, well, for some reason, I mean, uh, may, uh, to some extent, his own fault, but um, he's being criticized for jeopardizing Japan-U.S. alliance. But this is not just because of the leadership. The tension itself sort of makes people nervous whichever way Japanese government tilt. And so in that sense, managing this tension is crucial for domestic politics, but never tension will never go away. And then, what to do? I think the crucial <coughs> thing, on the one hand, on the first of all, is given the fact that China will rise, and the distribution of wealth and power will undergo changes in many years to come, then you want to make sure that the changing regional order uh, will, uh, uh, the, the change will not disrupt uh, the, the regional order in a abrupt way. You want to make sure the change will be revolu not, not revolutionary, but rather evolutionary. And one very important strategy to make sure that the change will be evolutionary is to make clear that Americans will remain engaged in this region and Japan should do whatever it can take to make sure that Americans will remain engaged. That means enhancing the predictability of regional order. You know, everybody knows that the change, I mean, the order is going to change. And one thing they don't want to know is there is nothing for sure. And therefore, you make sure that at least Japan-US alliance will there, will remain there. And therefore, all the countries in this region can build their security policy on the assumption that this alliance remains. But there are two ways to make this alliance in place, and I believe to give enough incentives to the Americans who, uh, so that Americans <coughs> remain engaged in this region. One is what Mr. Koizumi did, to try to develop Japan-US alliance as global <coughs> partnership. Uh, and the other is instead of sort of strengthening the, uh, the security side of this alliance, emphasizing economic side of the alliance more. Uh, and I suspect, even though uh, I have no clear uh, evidence to show, that some of the, the DBJ people might be thinking along the line, knowing that uh, one of the coalition partners 
uh, wouldn't uh, support uh, the strengthening uh, Japan-US security cooperation uh, any further. But in, in, in any event, it is very important for uh, the current government as well as the government to come uh, should figure out what to do to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance and to sell, to send the message to the world that this alliance will remain not just for the coming five years or ten years, but rather coming 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. That is one very important point, and I'm very sure there is a very broad consensus on, on this. The second important uh, strategy is promoting East Asian economic integration. Uh, simply because this is plus for most of the countries in this region, and also this, this is plus for Japan uh, because Jap uh, Japanese firms really need the market out there. And I forgot to mention here, but you know, I mean, if uh, the urban population reaches almost 1.5 billion, by 2030, and if we assume one quarter of the population are as rich as Japanese and Singaporeans, that means there will be something like 3 billion, uh, no, 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 uh, 300 million uh, population who are very rich. That means three times larger than Japanese market. So definitely there is a big market out there in 20 years, and therefore, I mean, everybody is natural. I mean, it's natural for everybody excited about this prospect. And yet, if we look at the current situation, everybody said that the United States can no longer pull the economic uh, growth of this region from demand side. And therefore, now many people talk about the, that uh, East Asia needs to shift from export-led uh, economic growth. To, uh, to domestic demand-led economic growth, and that is all fine. Uh, and but and yet, if we look at China's economic performance in 2008 and 2009, it's quite clear that the Chinese government came up with a huge uh, economic uh, uh, economic stimulus package uh, in 2008 and Chinese domestic demand expanded, and yet this expanding domestic demand did not translate into Asia's quote-unquote domestic demand. And also, it has become quite clear that Japan is becoming less trade dependent. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the past 10 years, China imported intermediate goods and capital goods from the rest of Asia and assembled goods and then exported those goods to the United States and European Union. Now, Chinese firms are producing more intermediate goods, even though they are still importing intermediate goods from the rest of Asia. And, and it is risky to say that this trend will stay, but this trend, if this trend stays, then China might become less trade dependent and less reliant on the import of intermediate goods from uh, the rest of Southeast Asia. And in that case, most likely the ASEAN countries will be threatened first. And there are already signs that some of uh, the ASEAN countries are complaining about the flooding of Chinese final goods, I mean consumer goods, and also they are complaining that China uh, is now importing less intermediate goods from their countries. So, for example, Indonesian Chamber, Chamber of Commerce already sort of uh, told the government that they want the government to review ASEAN-China free trade agreement. So there is uncertainty, and so and this is something we need to watch. More important, it became clear that, I mean, let me just give you one uh, a set of number. Uh, in the first half of the 2008, China imported 
uh, about uh, nine billion worth of consumer goods from uh, the rest of Asia. And in, two, uh, in the first quarter, in the first half of 2009, China imp imported about five billion worth of consumer goods. United States, in the first half of 2008, imported about 110 billion worth of consumer goods, and uh, in the first half of the 2009, it imported seven, uh, 75 billion uh, worth of consumer goods. Suddenly, the decline of American import from Asia uh, was a big shock to East Asian economies. But here, I want to draw your attention that China's import of consumer goods is less than 10% of American import. And this means even though China might grow very fast, Chinese market will remain far smaller than the American market. And that, in fact, is a very good lesson that East Asian community building, especially economic integration alone, is not enough. And I think it is now time, not only for Japan, but, other, uh, but also for other East Asian countries to explore FTA with the United States, not only to make the, uh, the region sort of open uh, for trade, but also actually that is a big plus for the region economic growth itself. So in sum, you can already see that there is not much room for the change in Japan's foreign policy. Despite all the changes in domestic politics, and of course, I mean, uh, we should fully understand that the new government uh, wants to show that they are different from LDP uh, in many different ways. And yet, I'm very sure, uh, and we'll see that uh, in coming months, that the government will stay more or less uh, I mean, uh, maintaining the same set of foreign policies uh, from LDP era. Uh, in, uh, actually, um, the US, Japan US alliance uh, remains, and also the East Asia community building, which was initially proposed by Mr. Koizumi, is now highlighted by Mr. Uh, Dr. Hatoyama that these policies will remain, and therefore. I hope that uh, we stay on course and uh, hopefully can develop uh, new ways of strengthening the relationship. Thank you very much.